Hello class, I want to go over some learning objectives for unit five that have proven most difficult over the years. On the one hand, this is somewhat of an easier unit because you can really focus in on one topic, which is the Civil War era. We already introduced the sectional crisis back in at the end of unit four. Now we're going to focus on secession and the Civil War and then move our way on up through Reconstruction, which is the period right after the Civil War where the country was rebuilding itself, especially the South, which was really torn up by the war. So I want to move, first of all, to the most difficult learning objective, I think, for this unit, which is, well, there are two uh, learning objectives for Chapter 19 that are somewhat difficult, which are number one and number four, 19-1 and 19-4. And um, these learning objectives really involve why the Civil War happened in the first place which is to say, why did the South secede uh, and try to break off and form another country? Um, this question of what caused the Civil War could be approached from a lot of different angles. On the one hand, you have the question of why the South seceded, and I think that's the main question. That's the ultimate reason for the war. Um, but there's also a more immediate cause of the Civil War, which is secession itself and the North attempting to keep the South in the Union. That's a that's another different different question is, is it legal or is it okay for states to secede in the United States? Um, but there are other ways to look at it. Uh, if that was going to happen, why did the North or the Union, the Republican Party, why did they block secession? And then you could also ask yourself the question of why did soldiers in the Civil War? That's another way of looking at why wars happen. Uh, but I want to put most of the focus here on uh, the first question, which is really the ultimate question, uh, which is why did the South secede? Why did the Confederacy want to leave the United States and form? And there are a whole bunch of different theories out there. And there's a lot of confusion among the public because Polls show that uh, students, for instance, coming out of the Texas public schools are in some cases being taught that slavery is not the main reason. That's that's more or less gone away now at this point. But we have a lot of students coming out of the junior highs and high schools who say that the reasons behind the war were very complex, which is true. But then also list slavery as maybe the third or fourth most important reason. And that's really very, very wrong. Slavery is without a doubt the the most important of all of these issues. But I do want to touch on some of the other issues. Um, you have uh, tariffs, for instance. The North and South absolutely did disagree on the tariff issue. It was very divisive regionally because tariffs were really set up to make imports from Europe artificially more expensive, which would help northern industry. It could incubate northern industry that way and give them a, a kind of a chance to gain traction and, and the United States could grow its own industrial manufacturing base without having to compete with Europe. That never really pleased the South. It did in the South was make goods more expensive coming in from Europe. But even more importantly, the South was very much an export economy, exporting cotton and sugar and other commodities to Europe, who in turn set up retaliatory tariffs. And so it did not help the South, the Southern economy. However, uh, the tariff issue had more or less been resolved by the 1850s and 1860s. There was some indication among the Republicans running in 1860, including Lincoln, that they might want to raise the tariff again. But basically, this had already been compromised and, and lowered on. And more importantly, nobody mentioned it. Nobody talked about tariffs. None of the Southern politicians or newspaper op-eds or anything like that really put a whole lot of emphasis on tariffs. Some people talk about the basic economic differences between the North and South, and they were developing uh, different economies, but economies that really relied on each other in a lot of ways. The, the industrial economy in the North did favor upward mobility and uh, opportunities to make new money in a way that the more stable, aristocratic, old-fashioned Southern economy, where most of the, the money was in the land, there was really a landed aristocracy sort of similar to classical Greece or Rome or, or Europe in the South. However, the, they were really interdependent. And the whole slave economy, in fact, was really sort of national, international, actually, Atlantic, insofar as, especially with cotton, uh, 
that cotton was grown on southern plantations with enslaved labor but then it moved up into textile mills in the north and in Europe and Britain where it was made into clothing. Um, there's no particular reason for that to have not continued, I wouldn't say. Um, but I think the opening of the West really raised the question of who, which type of economic model is going to take over the West, which in turn could take over the entire country. Then they would have the majority in the country, whereas there had been a, an even balance between the North and the South. And that's what really pushed, pushed the issue of whether these jobs out west were going to be for enslaved workers or for white wage workers. And I talked in the last unit how that created a real conflict of two incompatible forms of racism. The northern version really wanted to bleach the country and uh, get rid of slavery, partly as a way to get rid of African Americans in general. Um, but the, the most important thing being to keep the jobs open for white people. Whereas the Southern version of racism really uh, thought that God had put African Americans um, on the in on Earth to uh, toil for whites, for their masters, one of those had to give way, um, and so and you could think of the war as a, a kind of a struggle there. But that doesn't mean that that the economic differences don't involve slavery. They very much involve slavery. It's just a different way of talking about slavery, which is also true of this this uh, idea of, um, well, it was about honor. It was about morality. What kind of honor? Um, whatever kind of honor it was, it was an honor that was really violated specifically in time and space by the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. What was it about Lincoln that distinguished himself? Well, obviously, it was his opposition to Southern slavery. The Republican Party emerged as virtually almost a, a single issue party, or at least this was the issue that they stressed the most, was their opposition to the Western extension of slavery. Probably the most famous of these alternative uh, reasons for the Civil War, states' rights. This one, I think, is really very off base. Um, the, the South, especially after Dred Scott, did not believe that states had the right the new Western states, the new Western territories that were emerging as states and were drawing up their state constitutions, they did not believe that they had the right to outlaw slavery. Um, they thought that the national government should impose a pro-slavery regime throughout the West. Also, the in the summer leading up to secession, the Democratic Party broke along regional lines, north and south. And it was the northern branch of the Democratic Party that favored states' rights out south, out west, and the southern branch that opposed the states to be able to decide on their own over slavery. Also, when the Confederacy formed, they did not give their own states the right to determine whether they were going to have slavery or not. So states' rights is always an issue that people toss out there. And, and for my money, at least, it it's, tends to obscure um, people's real views behind an issue. They sort of hide behind it. Whenever somebody asks you about states' rights, they believe in states' rights, ask which ones they're talking about. I think it's obvious which one they're talking about in this case, which is the right of states to have slavery and for that right not to be threatened in any way, shape, or form. And that's made clear and obvious by the declarations of independence that all of the southern states published during secession. As they seceded, they made it very clear as to why they were seceding. There were a lot of different reasons tossed in there. I would advise taking a look at, for instance, Texas and South Carolina, Mississippi, um, you know, a few of the states, what they had to say. But one common denominator that comes up in all of them is the defense and perpetuation of slavery. They were not making any bones about it at all. Um, so all of these other reasons, uh, tariffs, well, the last three, especially economics, honor, states' rights, those are roundabout ways to talk about slavery. So usually in academics, we want you to think of things in more complex forms, but I think in this case, you could sort of see that common denominator and see through that and maybe make things less complex and just understand that slavery was really what drove the South to secede. Now that raises a whole other question, which is do states have the right to secede in the first place? And you can get into some of the constitutional technicalities of that as you read the chapter, and they're interesting. There are different 
uh, views on it one way or the other. It could happen again uh, in the future. A state could, or a, ser a, a number of states could try to leave the United States. Um, they didn't really clarify that too directly in the Constitution, probably because I think when architects and engineers drop blueprints, they usually don't drop a plan for how to tear the building down on the last page. And they were just assuming, I guess, that people who, you know, we would even care about the question would be states that would still be in the United States to begin with. And so it could be maybe somewhat of an irrelevant question, but it's, it's still a very important one. And Lincoln basically took the view that regardless of what the Constitution had to say about it, he just was not going to allow the, the country to get smaller and have a broken half like that, that there was no real justification for it because, in fact, he had won the election fair and square by the rules of the Constitution. And Lincoln was really somebody who I think had his heart a little bit more in the Declaration of Independence than the Constitution anyway as America's founding document with this emphasis on liberty and equality. Um, the South really saw, you know, the true revolution was not their revolution against the United States. The revolution was the new idea in the North that was that was rebelling against the traditional American uh, belief in slavery, which was embedded in the Constitution as part of our system, at least indirectly. Um, now, this also raises other questions as to why the North even blocked secession. There were plenty of people in the North that said, good riddance, let the South go away. We've been having these disagreements anyway. And, uh, you know, who knows? That could have led to some future war out West, although on paper the South was conceding that, that they were not making a claim to the West when they seceded. But I think if you look at the reasons that motivated the Republican Party and Lincoln for sure, the, their motivation for fighting was not abolition. It was not to end slavery. And in fact, they were willing to go along with a constitutional amendment that ironically would have been the 13th Amendment that would have permanently preserved slavery where it already existed in the Southeast. But the stance that Lincoln was taking was that they wanted to block it from expanding out West. And the Confederacy was really dedicated to expanding it out West or they overreact maybe if their only concern was to preserve it in the Southeast, then definitely secession was a mistake and it was an overreaction. And they just got a little bit too wound up and in fact, ironically destroyed slavery by seceding because that then led to the Civil War, which then later did turn into an abolitionist war. So we'll talk about how it, how it transformed and evolved into an abolitionist war later. And then finally, there's a whole other question when it comes to fighting in wars, which is why do um, soldiers fight? Well, there are many, many different reasons for that. They, despite their relative lack of education, and most soldiers had only been to a few years of school, they could write better than we can and were quite eloquent and uh, eloquent and wrote a lot of letters back home explaining and the reasons vary a lot um, some of them you know because God of course God is on always on both sides of every war um, some of them fought out of boredom some of them fought because they were afraid they'd be seen as as uh, cowardly if they didn't um, there were some that did fight indeed for states rights on the, the southern side there were maybe a few that fought for abolition on the northern side not not a whole lot there again on the northern side the main goal would have been preserving the union that was that was Lincoln's goal and, and that of many of his soldiers but another uh, reason that pops up from uh, Confederate soldiers from soldiers fighting for the south in their letters which is easy to overlook is that regardless of why this war happened and I would argue that it happened because of slavery uh, that once the war uh, kicked in the, the North was the aggressor. They had to take the, the battles to the South to go get control of the South and bring them back in. So they invaded the South. So a huge reason then for fighting from the Confederate soldiers' point of view would be self-defense or defending their home territory from an invasion. You could, I think, uh, reduce or distill an explanation of the Civil War down to a few words. You could probably even fit it in a, in a tweet if you if you saw fit. Um, but the South seceded to defend slavery and the North fought to stop secession. Two sides in wars don't always fight for the same thing. Good example of this would be the Vietnam War. The United States was in the Vietnam War to stop the spread of communism. 
a lot of North Vietnamese and even some in the South who were fighting against the United States weren't necessarily fighting for communism, but rather to prevent their country from being taken over, to block what they saw as the next imperialist wave after they had already been fighting the Chinese for centuries, and then the French, and then the Japanese, and then the French again, and they just saw the United States as the next imperial power. So I think that's true of the of the American Civil War as well. They weren't fighting over the exact same issue because the North, the South was fighting to defend slavery, but the North wasn't really fighting to defeat slavery, at least at first. Um, there is some truth, though, to the notion of the uh, of Lincoln as being the great emancipator, and the the war, you know, being fought for the glorious cause of of of, of freeing the slaves. And the reason for that is that it did become an abolitionist war midway through. And I think part of this has to do with the violence of the Civil War and how many people were dying, especially at battles like, for instance, Antietam uh, in uh, the northern part of Maryland in the fall of 1862, which was so violent, in fact, that it produced more casualties than all the Americans who had already died previously in the American Revolution and the War of 1812 and the Mexican War put together, those casualty numbers were lower than the, the battle at, at, at Sharpsburg, Maryland, Antietam. By the way, the uh, Civil War battles, you don't need to go memorize all the battles or anything like that. You want to know some of the major ones like Antietam and, and Gettysburg, but it, almost all of them have two different names with the North often naming it after a geographic feature like a creek or a river or a mountain or something like that, whereas the South tended to name them after the nearby town. But anyway, Antietam uh, really changed the whole war because on the one hand, I think that European investors who had buying had been buying uh, Confederate-issued bonds or been buying uh, cotton futures on the commodities markets in Amsterdam and places like that, really lost faith in the South. And they, they saw that, they, they saw Robert E. Lee's idea of trying to turn the tables and take the war into the North and invade the North as a mistaken notion. It was, they were really giving up on one of their huge advantages, which was a home field advantage where they really just had to hang on to the South and did not have to necessarily win every battle or anything like that. They just had to hang on long enough for the Union to give up sort of a similar situation to what the, the what the one the colonists were in during the American Revolution where they could have lost every single battle and wouldn't have mattered as long as they hung on long enough for the British to give up. But Lee had his reasons for invading the North and thought that he could uh, you know punish the northern civilians in the way that the southern civilians had been being punished and, and also gain supplies, maybe um, kidnap free blacks and enslave them, maybe find a way to get around into Washington, D.C. from the northern side that would be a little bit less defended. But anyway, both of his attempts to do that failed famously, the first one at Antietam, the second one at Gettysburg. But this Antietam battle also forced Lincoln um, to offer up a better explanation to the northern public, including a lot of northern parents who were seeing their son killed as to what this war was about in the first place. After all, at that point, if the Union had won the war and the South had given up its independence movement and come back into the United States, the North really wouldn't have gained anything. We would just would have been back to square one. We would have been back to where we were and as of 1860. Slavery still would have been in the South. Um, at that point, Congress especially I think started to consider a more radical option of let's let's get rid of the cause of this war. Let's really go for broke and not only try to win this war, but also abolish slavery while we're doing it. That way um, it'll make the lives being lost more worthwhile. And that way, if we do win the war, then we will have gotten rid of slavery, which will then prevent hopefully a second war from breaking out or we'll it'll get rid of the, the problem. And so they came up with the Emancipation Proclamation. They got Lincoln to go along with this idea. Um, but they did give the South three months to think over the offer. They said the original offer is still on the table. If you give up your push for independence, you will get to keep slavery. However, after that three months is up, if you've decided not to take us up on that offer, then it's all or nothing. And we are going to continue to try to break sl slaves free as we fight. And, in fact, 
Um, Frederick Douglass helped talk Lincoln into doing something that he was a little bit wary about at the first, which is also use free blacks to fight in the war, allow African Americans to participate in abolition. And that ended up being a big factor. In fact, by the very end of the war, there were more blacks fighting in the Union Army than there were whites fighting in the Confederate Army. That's partly because the Confederate Army was uh, had been really depleted by the end of the war. But uh, the Emancipation Proclamation then uh, turns the, the, the Union's cause into the so-called glorious cause uh, that we would sing about later in, in the Battle Hymn of the Republic, et cetera, which is that this did indeed become an abolitionist war. And it's also a key step in Lincoln's evolution from becoming, um, you know, somewhat of a sort of a racist or person typical of his time, you know, back in the 1850s in terms of not being able to envision an integrated society after the war, definitely did not believe in that blacks and whites should intermarry or anything like that. And really, by, as of the 1850s, Lincoln had still been a colonizationist, which is to say that he believed that if slavery was ever phased out, sort of similar to the founding fathers, if it was phased out eventually, that it would include part of that arrangement would include the deportation of uh, of uh, enslaved workers to uh, Africa or Latin America. So he he was not somebody who in, was able to envision a biracial um, society in the future. That starts to change really during the Civil War, and you can see it starting to change around the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, and he now is starting to develop kind of um, alliance and, and partnership with Frederick Douglass, who helped uh, take him to more progressive stances. So that by the very end of the Civil War, in fact, Abraham Lincoln was advocating citizenship, at least for the African-Americans who had fought in the war. It's one of the things that angered John Wilkes Booth so much and motivated him to assassinate Lincoln in 1865. But this push to to uh, include abolitionism as part of the war aims was hugely controversial in the North. A lot of Northerners were racist. They certainly didn't want to fight to free slaves. McClellan, who was um, the, the general in charge of the Army of the Potomac at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, he tried to bluff Lincoln into backing down. He said the entire army is going to walk off and, and leave the place. We're not going to fight for this. And you can especially, especially see this uh, tension boil over in New York City. New York had always been one of the stronger pro-Southern states. For one thing, they had a lot of textile mills there that were converting slave-grown cotton into clothing, but also they were one of the last states, New York and New Jersey, were the, the last northern states to outlaw slavery themselves. There were all kinds of bounty hunters there kidnapping free blacks and taking them down south, etc. Um, but New York was also home to a lot of recent immigrants from the Irish potato famine. Both sides of the war had volunteers for the first year or two, but then they quickly ran out of volunteers and they had to initiate drafts. And this was also controversial in the South because the planters themselves, their their wealthy sons, they didn't fight in the war. He, he basically had poor whites, um, you know, fighting for slavery in the South that didn't even own any slaves, which is partly how these myths about different causes and motivations for the war, uh, you know, emerged in the first place. But in the North, it was also controversial. Um, they had draft lotteries, wealthy people could buy their way out of the war. They could pay a poor person to go take their spot in the war, which had really high casualty rates throughout. Um, and the Irish were no exception to this. They came to America. They were the so-called blacks of Europe. Um, they were in a desperate situation, fleeing a famine when they came to the United States, and they got a lot of bad jobs, and a lot of them got thrown into combat in the American Civil War on both sides, the North and South. One of these Irish immigrants, Matthew Brady in New York City, he was starting to um, take a lot of photographs of the war. He couldn't take a lot of action shots because of the exposure wasn't long enough and the, they would just end up blurry. But he would take a lot after the battle, including at places like Antietam and Gettysburg. A lot of the really gory post-battle photos that we have were Matthew Brady's. And a lot of the Irish population in New York was starting to ask themselves, wow, why are so many of these people, people we know, um, why are dying at higher rates? Why do we want to fight to free slaves when, in fact, we're already on the worst run of the economic ladder in the North anyway? And if we free the slaves, then they would just come and compete with us for jobs. So you might think that 
being discriminated against and having the lowest paying jobs would make uh, the Irish sympathetic to enslaved workers, something like that. It doesn't work like that. They're thinking about their own um, prospects economically. And, you know, as often happens with urban riots in the United States, they very often happen in the summer. They happen in, in the heat. People don't have air conditioning. They often also involve alcohol. And that was definitely true of, of the draft day riots in New York City. They they happened on a draft day, but that's when things really began to began to get out of control. And you can read a little bit more about the details of the draft riots in the textbook. It, they were the worst urban riots in American history, but more generally, I think, represent uh, the the fact that Lincoln was really rolling the dice with the Emancipation Proclamation, because on the one hand, he would now have the support of abolitionists, and the war would be more meaningful, and it would be more meaningful if they won. They, would, they could change the country for the better, perhaps bring about, use that 13th Amendment not to preserve slavery like Lincoln had originally uh, supported, but to abolish slavery, which is, ends up being what happened. But he's also going to lose the support in the North of racists and people who don't want to, uh, you know, fight for slaves, basically. And so that was a juggling act for him from 1863 on, and it was very controversial as you come up to the 1864 election. This has to be one of the most important presidential elections in American history. I know that as a voter, they tell you that every year. Um, but had the had Lincoln lost in 1864, then it's very likely that the Union would have, at the very least, dropped the abolition platform from their uh, from their war aims, or they might have even just given up altogether. And who was Lincoln running against as a Democrat? None other than our old friend George McClellan, who had been uh, the head of the Army of the Potomac, Potomac and had not gotten along with Lincoln. He'd always thought Lincoln was sort of a um, baboon redneck from the frontier um, and really didn't respect him at all. Lincoln didn't think McClellan fought hard enough. He didn't think McClellan was aggressive enough and was too focused like a lot of the, the West Point um, generals on you know doing things like trying to win battles here and there rather than really go for the jugular and try to destroy Richmond. But he was running against McClellan and Confederacy didn't have a lot of money, but uh, with whatever money they had left, they were pumping it up into the, the Northern Democratic Party trying to get McClellan to hopefully defeat Abraham Lincoln. Didn't happen. Um, and I think one of the reasons it didn't happen was that the Union was able, excuse me, to secure some major victories in the Deep South, which they hadn't in 1864, especially with Sherman and his march to the sea after the, the defeat of Atlanta. I think the Battle of Atlanta probably belongs up there with Gettysburg and Antietam as one of the crucial battles because that's what really gave massive momentum to the, to the Union Army uh, prior to their, the march to the sea then by Sherman. But they really divided the, the South in half. They had always envisioned themselves as, as surrounding the South with a snake or the great serpentine, the, the, uh, the strategy um, that they came up with early in the wars to kind of choke the South off from being able to export its cotton and sugar to Europe that way. The great snake, as, as, as Winfield Scott uh, put it at the, at the beginning of the war, they now had sort of two snakes in the South um, with the Western War kind of now really isolated. And Lincoln had told uh, Grant and Sherman, he said, Grant, you hold the hind legs while Sherman skins the hide. What he meant by that was Grant was going to be fighting Robert E. Lee up here in Virginia, which is really where uh, the center of gravity was in the Civil War due to the proximity between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, which were only separated by 90 miles. So Grant, you hold the hind legs while Sherman skins the hide of the South, which is to say wreak major havoc on Southern civilization in terms of um, trying to, uh, you know, destroy ops, burn down barns, tear up railroads and destroy any human who gets in your path also while you're doing it, which increasingly at that point were really younger boys and older men because the, the Confederates were basically running out of soldiers by then. So Lincoln's election in November of 1864 occurs at a time when the Union was really on the verge of victory anyway. 
they carved out part of Virginia where they didn't have any slaves and that the Union Army occupied, turned that into a new state of West Virginia. They rushed Nevada into statehood, even though they didn't have the requisite population really up, so he got two more states that way. Anyway, he, he, Lincoln won a resounding victory in 1864, at which point it really then the, the critical political issue was not whether the Union was going to continue to fight, but whether or not they were going to try to secure abolition permanently with a constitutional amendment. And that did happen, and that became the 13th Amendment. However, if, as you move on into the last chapter, chapter 22 on Reconstruction, um, you're going to see that the North, the Union, was able to take advantage of the fact that the Southern states were not allowed back into the Union yet. They will hang on, isn't that backwards? Because didn't the Union fight the war to prevent the Southern states from leaving? Yes, they did. But then once they won the war, they said you can't come back in, or at least you can't have sitting uh, congressmen and senators in the Capitol who are voting until you agree on certain terms. Well, to the victor goes the spoils, as they say. And what ended up being those terms of readmission for the South during Reconstruction were these so-called Civil War amendments, sometimes called the Reconstruction Amendments. We're talking about 13, 14, and 15. The 13th Amendment that abolished slavery, except for those incarcerated, which ended up being a pretty big uh, loophole in the South during Reconstruction for reasons that you can read about in that chapter. And then the 14th Amendment, which is really perhaps the most important amendment in all of American history, because the 14th Amendment takes the first 10, or at least most of the Bill of Rights, and incorporates them down to the state level. So now, uh, not only can the national government not uh, violate your or abridge your freedom of speech or freedom of religion or freedom of the press or et cetera. But moreover, the state you live in also cannot. And the reason that th that came about during the Civil War is that the South was trying all kinds of angles to prevent blacks from enjoying citizens or freedmen, as they were called, the former enslaved workers, from enjoying the fruits of citizenship. Hopefully they, they and you can read the first section especially of, of the uh, 14th Amendment is uh, most crucial in that aspect. It basically outlaws racism on the part of states towards any, toward any of its citizenship citizens and, and doesn't allow states to abridge their other freedoms in the Bill of Rights like fear, uh, fair and speedy trials, etc. Um, now you would have hoped maybe that voting would have been included in that also. Um, however, they were finding ways to get around that as well. And so then they tacked on the last amendment, the 15th Amendment, which gave freedmen the right to vote. We're talking really about uh, African-American men here, not women, because women in general didn't have the right to vote yet in the United States. Were these amendments successful? Well, some historians have said that the North won the Civil War, but the South won Reconstruction. And I, I think if you were going to ask that question and, and you know, was the South able to, um, you know, get around these these amendments and were they able to create a, a in effect, an apartheid um, system similar to that what, that we've seen in South Africa more recently um, with a, a dominant race uh, denying c democracy, in effect, were they able to subvert democracy in the South? Yes, they were. And I think a good way of judging whether they were able to do that is to look at the efficacy or the success of the 13th and 14th Amendments, with the 13th Amendment being the most successful um, insofar as they were able to abolish slavery, and slavery never returned to the United States. On the other hand, almost all of the workers were thrown into working on similar plantations as sharecroppers as they had been before that. And if you pass enough laws saying you can't work anywhere other than being a sharecropper, then you're going to be doing a lot of the same sort of work that you did um, in the antebellum period before the war. The 14th and 15th Amendments were definitely gutted and weakened in considerable ways, and there are all kinds of ways to get around them. And that's why when, if you haven't taken History 1302 yet, and you take History 1302 and you get up to the modern civil rights movement, of the 1950s and 60s, it's sometimes called Second Reconstruction 
because these are periods in the 20th century when the Supreme Court really fleshed out and buttressed and strengthened the 14th and 15th Amendments and made them stick, resulting not only in, in a lot of Supreme Court cases that, that utilize those amendments, but also the 1964 Civil Rights Act that outlawed racism in public places in the United States and the, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which really closed a lot of the loopholes that they'd been using um, in a, in a, making it difficult for African Americans or Hispanics to vote based on the 15th Amendment. We're still fighting about the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and there's still people trying to push back on it um, and people trying to defend it. So these will be ongoing issues, I think, in, in American history. Um, the unresolved issues of Reconstruction really continue on up into the, to the modern era. Okay, well, I hope that uh, going over these learning objectives will, and for Chapter 22, it was really learning objectives um, to and uh, well, learning objective two, especially that I was focusing on there with the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments. But I hope going over all these learning objectives will help clarify things in the text and help you prepare for the fifth exam. So good luck.